So now we are turning to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So if you do indeed have a Bible on a device, if you have one paper copy or wherever you are, please open to that passage as we look today to God's Word. And the ultimate aim of today's message is that you would be strengthened, that you would be encouraged, and that you would have hope. And you'll see those words at the very end of the passage we're looking at today. And now we're looking at the whole chapter, and sometimes it's daunting to speak about a whole chapter, but this chapter fits together. Last week, if you didn't know, we did a whole chapter as well, as we're looking to see what God would speak to us as the Apostle Paul, again, is writing to the people in Thessalonica, and also writing to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the focus of today's chapter of a message this morning is on the second coming. So the title of the message is Concerning the Second Coming. Because people there had heard a report that Christ had already come. And they were afraid, they were timid, they were wondering, they did not know. And so Paul is addressing that very specific question that they had. And a lot of people, not just in that day, but in our day and in the past and surely in the future, wonder about this day. And they wonder because it is written in a holy book called the Bible. So this is more than just something that was written down or some prophet or some whatever fortune teller. This is something that has been revered. This is something that has been studied. This is something that had been written down by the Holy Spirit of God himself. And so we have to pay attention to what I'm going to call a historical future event that will impact everything and everybody. This isn't some fairy tale. This is something that God himself proclaimed to us. And so it is wise for us to understand what will indeed happen. Now, Scripture does tell us about these things, and this is one of those passages. But it doesn't tell us everything, okay? God tells us in his word that his divine power, should be on the screen, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Now, that verse has helped me many times and when I've wished, I wish I had more information about more specifics about. In particular, in this passage, it would have been great to know the very name of this individual called the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. I would have liked to know more. And there are other things in the scripture that I would want to know more. But I trust that we have everything we need, okay? You have everything you need for both life and godliness. God has assured us of that. Now, that being said, let's look to what we do know and what God has given to us so that we will learn and not be deceived. And you'll see this right in the beginning. Don't be deceived. He says, do not be deceived. And he goes on and tells us some truth about this man of lawlessness and what we are to expect before Christ is returning. And then at the end he says, okay, now hang on, hold on to the truth that you know. And then he says, be encouraged, have hope, have strength by his grace. So that is a rough outline of this chapter. And so we're going to follow along with Paul and the Holy Spirit as he tells us some things that will help us to know so that we can have hope and stand strong. So here is the first main point. Do not be deceived about the second coming. Do not be deceived about what is going to take place because many have been deceived. Many in the church have been deceived. Deceived. And by the way, this letter is written to the church, okay? So pay attention. So here we go, 2 Thessalonians, starting with verse 1 of chapter 2. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered to him. He's coming to us, and we're going to be gathered to him. And he talks about this in various places. We ask you, brothers, sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us. 
whether by a prophecy that is given or by word of mouth, people just passing information to one another or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has past tense already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. We're going to pause right there. So concerning the second coming, you have the primary responsibility. You have it, okay? Personally, to make sure that you are not deceived. My job is to help you from the scripture to see what's there. Your job is to pay attention. Because people throughout history have claimed extravagant, extravagant things about what is to come. And they said it, and they say it like it's gospel truth. If it's not written in the Bible, don't hold on to it. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Okay. Hear me. This has happened then, it has happened throughout history, it's happening our day, it will happen in the future. So you, I, do not be deceived. And many people have been deceived and unsettled, unmoored, that's unanchored, that's what it means. Or alarmed and scared, right? And they have gone into things that are not profitable and th ways of thinking. This is happening because we have the wonderful advent of the internet, which we can propagate all types of garbage in the name of God. Right? Anyone here ever heard of YouTube? Knowing the truth will bring you perspective. And perspective will bring you peace to help you to continue to persevere and be productive. Let me say that again. Okay. Knowing the truth will give you perspective. And with God's perspective, you will have peace. And in peace, you'll be able to persevere and be productive. That many people who are so infatuated by who is the Antichrist and what is the mark of the beast and when is Jesus coming? And it, is it this, is it that, is it this, is it that, is it this, is it that? And they just sit in speculation and stagnate and not become productive in doing good. This happens today, and it might be happening in your life as well. So know the truth. And knowing the truth about the second coming will save you from joining a cult. It could literally save your life. Now, if people would have known the truth about the second coming, they would not have followed an individual called Jim Jones. Did that ring a bell to you? Okay. 1978, he founded the People's Temple, and they were in Jonestown, Ghana, and he convinced more than 900 people. This was not a small group. It wasn't him and his isolated family. It was 900 people, including 300 children. And he convinced them about his prophecies, about the second coming, that they were to drink cyanide-laced Drink Kool-Aid, Flavor-Aid. It was the greatest loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act until 9-11. Deceived. Because they did not know the truth. And it literally, there it is, li literally, you know what's interesting about this? This week, we tested this microphone. And I did everything in my power to make it crackle like this. And it didn't. Here we are. Please silence your cell phones. No, I'm joking. Yeah, I jumped around the stage, and I am not doing anything. Okay, so if it, if it still crackles, I'm going to move to plan B. We're going to get another microphone. 
Unbelievable. Okay. If these people would have known the truth about the second coming, they wouldn't have committed math, uh, math, <laughs> math suicide, mass suicide. Knowing it's truth, not being deceived, could literally save your life. Knowing the truth about the second coming, like I said, would keep people from joining cults like the Jehovah Witnesses. The founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Russell, taught that the world would end in 1874. Now, when the world didn't end in 1874, often as false prophets do, they revised their calculations, saying, well, I got it a little bit wrong. It's going to be 1914. He bought himself a little more time. But as we know, Christ did not come back in 1914, so they didn't want to look bad, so they said he did come back, but invisibly. Right. And know what the sad truth is? Millions of people today have fallen for that lie. Millions. And that's not the only one. And so when he is warning us, okay, us, about knowing the truth and saying, do not be deceived, he's doing so because it is a problem. I'll never be deceived. Really? You say that, okay? You could be vulnerable. How do you know that you're not deceived? Know the truth. It'll save you from possible literal death. It'll save you for joining a cult. It'll save you from being worried and alarmed and upset and uptight and unproductive. Do not be deceived. And so then he continues. This is the next point. Know what is true about the second coming. So here we go, and there's going to be a lot of stuff. You're not going to remember it all. Okay? There's notes in the back. You can download notes, take your own notes, whatever. If you're thinking about the second coming, this is one of the chapters you can go to. At least remember that. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 will help along with other passages. So know what is true about the second coming. So let's continue in verse 3, the second part of that verse. So Paul says, now don't be deceived. Now let me tell you, now that day, for that day, that's the day of the Lord, Christ coming back, will not come until two things occur. Number one, the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness is unveiled, revealed, like a statue being pulled the veil away. The man who is doomed to destruction. So, according to this passage, okay, we're going to look at things that we can know. Two things must happen before. Okay, check that. These things haven't happened. Jesus hasn't come back. The rebellion will take place, and the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Okay. So what is the rebellion? What is that? Well, we can say that the rebellion is led by the man of lawlessness, but who is the rebellion against? Okay, This rebellion is against God himself and his kingdom. This is not a political rebellion. This isn't a national rebellion. Takeover. This is not a global government. It's not against any human institution or government. This is against God. There is rebellion against Him. And we're going to see more of this. It is the rebellion, a complete rebellion against what is taught in Scripture, a rebellion, a rejection. Specifically when it comes to the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Read 1 John, and I have other passages in the notes. It's against him. 
But it's even greater than that. Second, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. This is not a man of lawlessness. And there's plenty. Okay? This is the man of lawlessness. This man will be physically present on the earth. This isn't a spiritual thing. This is an, this is an individual. It's not even an organization. It is a person. This is what Scripture says. This man will be physically present on the earth, and he will be unveiled, be shown. Now, many people have wrongly identified who this person is, and the list is long. Throughout history, we, we like to guess this stuff, don't we? Well, it's a, a Roman Empire, or it's the leader of the Vandal Invaders. It's Muhammad, or various popes have been identified as the Antichrist. The papacy itself, and Emperor Frederick II, Pope Gregory IX, Martin Luther, people thought he was the Antichrist. King George II of England, Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon III. Each side of the American Civil War, they thought that the leader of the North and the leader of the South, that for surely is the Antichrist. People have thought this. People thought the League of Nations in the Antichrist, or Hitler, right? Good candidate, not evil enough. Mussolini, Stalin, United Nations, the Soviet Union. Mikhail Gorbachev, right? That mark for surely had to be the mark of the beast, right? Remember this? We loved that in the 80s. For sure, he's the Antichrist. He's not. <laughs> Yasser Arafat, Saddam Hussein... Keep going. Even former presidents, Jimmy Carter was the Antichrist. Ronald Reagan, recently Barack Obama, Antichrist. Wrong. People believe this nonsense. Why? Because they don't know Scripture. Pay more attention to YouTube than they do to God's Word. We laugh because it's true. So there's going to be a rebellion against God. There's going to be a man of lawlessness, a person physically here. And this person is doomed to destruction. These two things have to happen before he comes back. Okay? So pay attention and look for these things. Now Paul then continues to go on and tells us more about this law, man of lawlessness. Who is this? And there are some things that we can know about this individual. So this is the next point. Know what is true about the man of lawlessness. And here are some things we can know that are true about this person. Okay? Pay attention. And it's right from Scripture. We are 2 Thessalonians 2, now into verse 4. He sheds more light on this person. He, the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, okay, will, what will he do? Number one, oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up. The Antichrist has appeared. I don't know what's going on. We're going to swap it out. He's elitist. He knows techie things. Okay. That in your pocket. And okay. So you have to leave this out, I guess. We'll leave it out. Okay. All right. There goes that thing. All right. Pay no attention to the wire. Oh, it's going to my pocket. Okay. Hey, we were talking about something. Antichrist, that's right. Notice. He will oppose and he will exalt himself over everything that is called God. Stop. Okay. So what do we know? He will oppose everything that is called God or worship. He's not just going to be against Christianity. 
That's the primary target because that's the truth. He will be against Jesus Christ. He will be against Allah or Muhammad. He will be against every god the Hindus worship. He will be opposed to all of them. That's why he's called the man of lawlessness, the man of actual sin. That's what it means. He's going to oppose all religions, everything that's worshipped. And there's tons of stuff that's worshipped around the world. So it's not just specifically only against Christianity. It's against every religion. Opposes it. And not only will he oppose it, he will then exalt himself above it. Saying he is greater than the God of Judaism, Yahweh. He'll he'll be against Judaism. He'll be against Christianity. He'll be against Islam. He'll be against Buddhism and Hinduism and any isms you can think about. Against it and above it. Saying, I am the true incarnation or whatever he is going to proclaim, above all things. We may even have a theme song written already by a guy named John Lennon. Imagine, there's no (laughs) heaven, there's no hell below us. Imagine we're all living together. Imagine there's no countries Nothing to kill or die for and no religion. So this person will oppose everything that's called God or worshipped. And he will exalt himself over everything that's called God or worshipped. We can know this. We can also know he will set himself up in God's temple. Lots of questions about that. Now, in the context of that time, the Thessalonians only knew of one temple that was set up in a place called Jerusalem. And so, it has led many scholars and their speculation, well, it's the church or it's this thing, okay? Many scholars would say that they believe there will be a temple rebuilt. And you can see Daniel and you can see Matthew and you see Mark saying that he will set himself up in God's temple. So I want you to pay attention. If they are hitting that right, if there is a temple rebuilt in Israel, if you see that, pay attention. Set up steps in that direction. So the man of lawlessness will oppose all religions. He will set himself above them all, and he will place himself in God's temple, and then he'll proclaim himself to be God. Not just claim to be God, but proclaim to be God. That's a statement, a huge statement, so pay attention to this. Now he tells us more, and it's important us to know some more details. This is in verse 5 through 8, okay? And just follow along in scripture, because I'm just pulling all of these things right from our passage. He goes on and says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? So apparently Paul had conversations with the church in Thessalonica. Thessalonica, And you know what is holding him back. So that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Okay, let's hold the phone here. What's going on here? (laughs) So apparently Paul had conversations with those in Thessalonica about what was holding this man of lawlessness back. He says, you guys know what it is. Paul didn't tell us what it is. We're kind of outside of that conversation, but this is what we know about this. Number one, he is being held back, okay? He's being held back. So do we know what's holding him back? And there's been speculation. Maybe it's the church, maybe it's the gospel, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. 
Maybe it's an angel. We don't know for sure, but we do know that he is being held back, which means that he is not the greatest or highest power. Amen. He is under submission. He is being held back. He is not the great power. God is. And so whatever is impeding and holding this back tells us that God is in control and something is hindering. Until the proper time. He will be revealed at the proper time. This is verse 6. What time is that? Don't know. God knows. And there's a date declared for this to happen. You can trust God that God knows what he's doing. It's an amen spot, right? God is sovereign over all things. When it is time and God's wisdom, God wants you to just destroy this man. There's another good question. Why are you allowing this to take place? He allows it to take place because it shows who people are. He'll be revealed at the proper time. Verse 7. Being held back, revealed at the proper time, and then he has a secret power. For the secret power, verse 7, of lawlessness is already at work. What is that? Well, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, lawlessness is sin. Is there sin working in the world today? Who? Are there pastors and religious leaders who prey on precious children? There are. The power of sin is working to harden hearts. The power of sin is working to deceive. Secret power is working to distort the gospel. His power is working. Even to this day, it's working. So this man of lawlessness, this man of sin, being held back, will be revealed, opposed to everything that is worship, exalt himself over it everything that's called God, placing himself in God's temple. He works by the power of sin. Verse 8. To whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth. Just the breath. The same breath that gave life, the same breath can take it. And destroy by the splendor of his coming, the true king will enter the building. And all imposters will be destroyed. Come on. The splendor of his coming by a word be destroyed. So don't fear. So he will be overthrown and destroyed by Jesus. (laughs) Which means within the normal lifespan, normal lifespan, however long that is, 80 years, 90 years, 100 years, longer, (laughs) normal lifespan of this person, Jesus, will return. Pay attention. And he'll overthrow him with the breath of his mouth. 
the splendor of his coming, okay? Know this. Don't be deceived by someone knocking at your door. Now he continues, verse 9. And the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. Well, this will clue us in how Satan works. So he's coming in accordance, the same way that Satan works. This isn't Satan, by the way. Someone different. Now, he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders to serve the lie. And in all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. So the man of lawlessness will be able to perform signs and wonders. These are genuine, supernatural miracles. Done not by the hand of God, but by the power of Satan. What is that? Could be even healings. Could be even having Egyptian uh, magicians changing, remember this, from the Old Testament? Staff into a snake just like God. Water into blood just like God. There is a supernatural demonic power that also is at work in the world. But it's not there to serve God, it's there to serve a lie. Be aware of this. Is God doing miracles? Yes. But the deceiver has some power, not the power, and does them to why? To prove that he is worthy of worship. So this God self-declared man of lawlessness, will literally be able to perform miracles. And when people see the miracles, they'll say, well, surely this is God. Jesus did miracles to honor God and to free people. He does miracles to deceive and to kill and to overpower People will see these things and say, well, surely this is God. Look at what he's doing. These things are there to serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Wickedness has a power to blind people from the truth. Those who are perishing will believe this. Another bullet point straight from the text. Let's continue. What else will be helpful for us to know? Now, he talks about these people being perished or perishing. Well, what about that, and how can we avoid that? Well, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. That's a significant statement. People who know the truth and reject the truth. They refuse to love the truth. In order to be saved, you have to know that you need to be saved from something. In order to to be saved, you have to know that you need saving. In order to be need saving, you have to believe that you're a sinner. In order to believe that you're a sinner, you have to believe that there's a right and wrong. In order to believe that there's a right and wrong, there has to be a lawgiver. And in order to be saved, there means that there's going to be an accountability. And people don't like to be accountable to a holy God. Doesn't everyone like to think that they're good? If we did a survey and went down and said, hey, do you think you're a good person? Most people will say, yeah. Right? Compared to my neighbor, I'm a lot better. Or compared to Hitler, I'm great. Oh, so that's the standard? Hitler? Where are you at compared to Christ? How do you, how do you rate on the Ten Commandments? How are you doing? Okay. 
People refuse to love the truth because they don't want to believe what's true about them. And so they've rejected the truth. And for this reason, God says, okay, sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. God, that's not very nice. You'll see this in Romans, and you'll see it in multiple places in Scripture. God turns people over to what they believe. To give them opportunity to prove who they are. And so they've already rejected him. God's action does not cause people to reject the truth, but is a consequence of their previous rejection. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. There are people on this planet who delight in wickedness. It's horrible. Killing people. Imprisoning people. Abusing people. Delighting in it. This is on this planet. This is is allowed to happen to show the truth about people and to, throw, <laughs> and to show the truth about God himself, the God of justice we saw last week in chapter 1. So what's the final result of this, okay? And there's a lot of things to know here, okay? Pay attention. I don't want any of you to be deceived by this. I don't want, any, I don't want to hear about any of you falling for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Or falling for whatever. So this is his final um, thing for us, okay? <laughs> Starts not being deceived. Talks about the man of lawlessness. Talks about what's going to take place at Christ's coming. And then he concludes this way. And this is why I'm including this whole chapter. Because it's all together. Verse 13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because why? God chose you. God did this as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. God's choosing, God's working through belief in the truth. He called you to this through the gospel that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news. <laughs> so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you. Whether by word of mouth or by letter. So what do we hold to hold fast to? The word. So why are we grabbing all of this trash that's out there that is not the word? So I tell you repeatedly, read your Bible. Have you heard me say that? Why? It'll save you. It'll keep you. It'll watch over you. It'll change you. Stand firm, hold fast, because there will be storms, there will be things, there will be people, there will be difficulties, there will be hardships. Hold on. Like a sailor in a storm, a new day will come. The king of glory will appear. So hold on. And so Paul concludes with a final prayer in this section at the end of this chapter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us by his grace, not because of his, our goodness. Right? He loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are. 
He loved us by, our, by his grace, gave us eternal encouragement. Here we go back to what I talked about in the beginning. Eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So the end result of knowing this stuff is not being smarter, but being equipped to proclaim his goodness to the nations. Now that you know, don't get deceived. Now go! right? Because of his grace. Telling people the truth of salvation and his gospel. Be encouraged. Have good hope. Be strengthened. Living for Christ sometimes is very difficult. It will cost you, but it is worth it. It is worth it. So I'm going to pray these words for us, and we're going to conclude. Okay? No, it's a lot of information, but I want you to be encouraged about the power of God, the grace of the gospel, the love of Christ and who God is. So God, here we are together in this place in various places. God, I ask that one of the testimonies about this congregation is people would say that they know the word, they love the Lord, they continue to do good. God, I pray, we pray for people who are bound and deceived right now. We pray for deliverance. We pray for clarity. We pray for truth. We pray for a change of heart. God, we pray for those who are delighting in wickedness. God, we ask that they would delight them no more. They'll be convicted. They'll be converted. It would be repentive. God, we pray that the gospel will be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. God, help us to be aware. We pray for every church on this planet who believes in your word, who has your Holy Spirit, will declare it with clarity. That people will gravitate and hold on to it like a drowning person being given a life vest. And God, I pray, I ask that this congregation would be encouraged, that we would have great hope, that we would be strengthened by your Spirit, and be prepared for whatever may come. But we will say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Help us, God, to follow you in proclaiming this message with clarity and hope. And we look forward to the glory and the splendor of your appearing. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.